Welcome once again to our <coughs> teachings and the readings of God's Word. The Word of the Lord is already blessed. But this is a special segment right now about the life of Joshua. Joshua is a perfect example for all of us to follow in trusting God in the midst of uncertainty and increasing our faith in the belief that all things are possible with God. Having recently studied the book of Joshua, I just want to take some time today to look at what lessons we can learn from the life of Joshua. Joshua, the name means the Lord saves or the Lord is our salvation. The Greek form of the name is Jesus. The Bible tells us Joshua was the son of Nun of the tribe of Ephraim. You can find that in Numbers 13.8. He's also referred to Oshea and Hoshea. Joshua was born in Egypt and endured the years of slavery before the Exodus. During the Exodus, Mo Moses identifies the attributes in Joshua to warrant giving him responsibility for leading Israel's defence against the Amalekites. Amalek's in Exodus 17 verses 8 to 16. God gives Israel the victory by Moses' intercession and Joshua's actions. In Exodus 17, Joshua fights the Amalekites, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur are on top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, they were losing. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on each side of Moses, so that his hands remained steady till sunset, and Joshua was victorious. So the first lesson that we can learn from Joshua's life is that we achieve results when we all work together, recognising that we have different giftings and callings. Joshua is referred to as Moses' minister in Exodus 24-13, when Moses goes up Mount Sinai in 32-17, when Moses tells him they have to go back to the camp. The second lesson that we learn from Joshua's life is that we need to serve faithfully in the house of God without seeking to exhort ourselves. Joshua was in attendance whenever the Lord would speak to Moses in the tent of the meeting outside the camp, Exodus 33, 11, giving us our third lesson. We need to spend time in the presence of God. In Numbers 11, 27 to 29, Joshua learned the value of the anointing of God's Spirit from Moses, when Joshua would have forbidden certain elders to prophesy. Giving us our fourth lesson, God can use anybody to advance his agenda. Believing that things have to be done in a certain way can prevent us being part of the advance of the kingdom of God and enjoying those benefits. We see that Joshua is one of the spies who goes into the promised land. It gives him the opportunity to learn at first hand the nature of the Canaanites and the geography of the land that he would later use in the conquest. He demonstrates his faith in God in advocating along with Caleb that they go in and take the land. Numbers 14, 6 through 9. He and Caleb were the only two to go into the promised land from the original man. This gives us our fifth lesson from Joshua's life. God has made his promises, and if we stand in faith on them, we will realise the benefits. But if we doubt them, we will lose what God has in store for us. When Moses is told by God that he will not enter the promised land, he asks God to give them a new leader, Numbers 27, 17 through 18. God instructs Moses to appoint Joshua and give a charge in front of the whole congregation, which Moses does in Deuteronomy 31. And then God now uh, renews that commission in Joshua 1, 1 through 9. Joshua is not like Miriam and Aaron in Numbers 12, or Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and on Numbers 16, who rebelled against God and Moses and tried to take control of the Israelites. So our sixth lesson is that Joshua knew that promotion comes from the Lord in the Lord's timing. He didn't challenge Moses' leadership. In Joshua 1.8, God tells Joshua, Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. God tells Joshua to, to obey all the law Moses gave to Israel, which he did. The word of God written in the Pentateuch was to be Israel's central authority 
as opposed to all human ideas, tradition or religions. So our seventh lesson is, the word of God written in the Bible is to be our central authority as opposed to all human ideas, traditions or religions. In Joshua 2, we see that Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent spies, uh, two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. So our eighth lesson is that when God instructs us to do something, there are times when that means we have to sit down and plan how to bring this thing to pass. It does not always mean that we rush into something without planning it. It's only by spending time in the presence of God can we discern when we're to plan and when we're to step out in faith immediately. But make no mistake, it's always a step in faith. And then it came to the crossing of the Jordan. In Joshua 3 we read, And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so they may know that I am with you, as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, When you reach the edge of the Jordan's water, go and stand in the river. Now then, choose twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off from <coughs> and stand up in a heap. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground, while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. <clears throat> the Jordan did not rise up to allow the Israelites uh, to pass until the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant had stepped into the water. It was by faith. They believed, that they acted, and then they saw the result. A ninth lesson from the life of Joshua is that we need to make memorials to remind ourselves in the future of what the Lord has done for us, to encourage us and teach our children of God's provision. We need to find ways to celebrate the things that the Lord has done for us. And our tenth lesson is that we need to involve as many people as possible in making the memorials for God. Participation will make it seem more important for the individuals and their families or tribes. Joshua 5 says that when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So our eleventh lesson is that the commander of the army of the Lord tells Joshua he is on neither side, but is perfecting the will of God. Joshua must be on the Lord's side. It's a reminder to us, we cannot claim the Lord for our side, we must be firmly on the Lord's side. And now we come to the fall of Jericho, which we read in Joshua 6. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up. Everyone straight in. Our twelfth lesson is that Joshua is given what appears to be strange instructions, but he's faithful and follows them, and as we know, the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. Sometimes the Lord's instructions appear to be crazy to our human mind, but we have to humble ourselves and be obedient. There are times when we can get uh, swayed by our own importance and fail and make mistakes, and we see this in Joshua 7, when Joshua makes a mistake of not consulting God before attacking Ai. And Israel is defeated. Even Joshua despairs, which he had not done before in the wilderness. There's a difference in being a leader compared to the assistant to the leader or second in charge. Only after this defeat does Joshua seek God's face and is told about Arkan's sin of taking the dedicated things. Arkan is identified after being given an opportunity to repent, but does not. So our thirteenth lesson is that Joshua is a type or representative of Jesus Christ and that he led God's people into the promised land and to victory over their enemies. 1 John 1, 1.9 tells us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
If we do not confess these sins, then we'll meet Jesus from Revelation 20, 11 through 15. Our uh, 14th lesson is, we must keep our focus firmly on God so we do not make bad decisions. And then we move to chapter 9. Again, we see Joshua failing to consult the Lord when he's tricked by the Gibeonites. Fearing the Israelites, the Gibeonites make out there from a land far off and come seeking to make a treaty with the Israelites. The treaty is made and then three days later it's discovered the Gibeonites live in the land, but by then the oath to protect them has been made. The people are angry at the leaders for being tricked, but the Gibeonites are spared to become woodcutters and water carriers for the Israelites. Joshua's error comes from four strategies the devil uses that we need to be on guard against. Our fifteenth lesson is that the first of these strategies is distraction. Joshua was too busy and made a snap decision. We need to make it a priority to always seek God's face before making decisions. Lesson 16 is deception. Joshua took the appearances of the Gibeonites at face value. We need to ask tough questions before we make decisions. Our seventeenth lesson is doubt. Joshua doubted God's command to remove the Canaanite nations from the land. We need to doubt our doubts. And our eighteenth lesson, division. Creating strife amongst themselves, the people were upset with their leaders in this case, making it a priority to do the right thing, even if it hurts us. The people are angry at the leaders for being tricked, but the Gibeonites are spared to become woodcutters and water carriers for the Israelites. Which gives us our nineteenth lesson. As leaders, our decisions and character influence those who observe us. We must faithfully represent Christ or we will tarnish his name and cause others to resent God. Chapter 23 records Joshua's farewell to the leaders. He reminds the people to observe the law, not to associate with the nations still amongst them, but to hold fast unto the Lord God who has driven out of the land great and powerful nations. Again he warns of the dangers of turning away from God and allying themselves with the survivors of these nations that remain. And if they intermarry with them and associate with them, then they will become snares and traps, whips on their backs and thorns in their eyes, until they perish from the land which God had given them. But if they violate the covenant of the Lord and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against them, and they will quickly perish from the land. Joshua then challenges the people. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, and then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served on the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua then gets them to make a public confession. Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord. He's a holy God. He's a jealous God. <clears throat> he will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he's been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. Joshua then gets the people to reaffirm their decision. In verse 22 we read, Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses, they replied. Joshua then gets the people to confirm that this is to serve only one God. Now then, said Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. Joshua then makes a memorial to the confessions. On that day Joshua made a covenant for the people, and there at Shechem he reaffirmed for them the decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Our twentieth lesson. We must plan for what happens after we disappear from the scene. Joshua's speech and affirmations received from the people leave no doubt as to what has been agreed and by whom. We must leave a testament of instruction and a plan for a successor. In Joshua's situation, there was not to be one leader, but each tribe was to have their leader with a high priest leading the nation's worship and religious observance. Joshua was the leader of Israel in the conquest of the Promised Land. But note the transaction of conquest. God went before the Israelites and gave them victory. The victory won the land that was dedicated to the Lord God. God then gave the land back to the Israelites as stewards. This is the essence of the term, dedicating to the Lord. It meant removing the object or person from any other use apart from that for God. God then purposed the land to be passed back to Israel under stewardship. 
The primary identification of people living in the land became the people of God. Our 21st lesson from the life of Joshua is an application for the New Testament. Under the New Testament, it's not the land that's set apart from God. It's our bodies that are the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. And we need to dedicate them to the Lord by focusing on the fruit of the Spirit and driving out the acts of the sinful nature, Galatians 5, 16-26, just as Joshua drove out the Canaanites. And our final lesson, lesson 22, is that our identity is not to Israel, but is to be one in Christ, Galatians 3, 28. We should not identify ourselves first in any other way, so our first allegiance should be to our fellow Christian before our fellow compatriot or any other grouping. This is how we serve the Lord under the new covenant. Joshua declares in his farewell address, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. So the question that we must ask ourselves as we conclude this study on the lessons to learn from the life of Joshua is who are we going to serve? Are we going to serve those foreign gods? Or are we going to serve the Lord? I pray today that their answer will be that we will serve the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us just pray. Father God, we give you thanks for studying this time to study your word. We pray now that we confess our sin and we repent of everything that we've done that is not pleasing to you. We pray now that we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. We accept him, Father God, that, that uh, as our Lord, we believe in our hearts that uh, he died and that uh, God raised him from the dead. And now, Father God, as we acknowledge you as Lord, we are born again. We become a, a citizen of the kingdom of God and we put away that life of sin that we previously had. And we declare today that this day, from now on, we will serve the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. As you remember in the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verses 15, and God's word said, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond Ephraim or the gods of Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Joshua is saying, because of the faithfulness of God, he has proven God over and over time again, that the presence of God makes all the difference in our life. The faithfulness, the comfort, the joy, the assurance of God's provision And although there are circumstances, there are times even individuals or people that try to discourage us. When our faith is in God, that's what really matters. And that's what really moves God's hands. So in the life of Joshua, we are encouraged to believe that in spite of who believes what, as long as our relationship with God is genuine, we know what God can do because he has proven himself to us before. We have every right to believe he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever will be. He's the same faithful God he's proven himself to Joshua, and he will do it for us. He's the same sovereign, holy, righteous God. As he did it to Joshua, he'll do it for us. And there's no secret what God can do. But keep trusting and believing, in spite of, especially during the difficult situations and circumstances. We presenting all our petitions to God, God is well able. To grant us, grant us our desires. So we are truly the light in the midst of the darkness. And truly we can triumph over any situation, no matter how the enemy presents itself. 
the life of Joshua is one of courage. He didn't see things the way the natural man or woman would see it. He always saw things the way God sees it. From God's perspective and the obedience and believing God on his word, that's what Joshua lived on. That's what he lived his life. That's what he taught his family. Trust God. Believe God in spite of. And God will bring it to pass. Our part is to continue to seek God's face. Continue to present all our plans, all our dreams, all our desires to him. And God will align everything. Even for those that may not even believe it could happen. God will intervene and he will invade. And all it takes is faith. And as God did it before, he will do it again. Joshua displayed that in his lifestyle. But most importantly, in his home, his family, he taught them the things of God. He taught them. He encouraged them to trust God and to believe God in spite of. So we give God, thanks for handpicking us and even in difficult situation, choosing us to make the difference. Choosing us to make an influence to advance his kingdom. And always remember, faith is what moves God's hands. In the book of Hebrews, he says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And even if you find as though your faith is little, pray that God increases your faith to believe and he will grant you that desire. In the name of Jesus, amen.